Uh, Preston, wide array of stories that we heard, but so many boil down to a common theme. These families say that police, they had other options than to kill, but were too quick to resort to deadly violence. Each story is unique, but for the families who no longer have these loved ones, they share a similar pain. We, like so many other families, have had to bury our loved ones with zero consequences given to those who took them from us. In a Facebook forum, Elaine Simon spoke out about the officer who killed her foster son. He is one of the few to now face criminal charges. One of our demands is going to be reopening and looking at all the Washington cases. Charlena Lyles was shot in front of her children inside her Seattle home. Police say she lunged at them with a knife, but Lyle's cousin says before the use of force investigation was even over, they were told the officers would not be prosecuted. They're just going through the motions. It's just another black life loss. When Yosea Falatoa was killed, he had run from his car holding a gun. But family says the body camera video shows he was already on the ground and the gun no longer in his hand, but was still shot in the head. If Officer Keller acted according to policy, then the SPD needs to change policy and training. In sharing these stories, these families hope to keep up the momentum and the calls for police accountability that ignited this summer. They just keep killing us and, and getting away with it. And, and I'm hoping that we could change some of these policies. It's hard not to notice what taggers have done to Seattle while COVID restrictions have been in place. This is a picture pre-COVID of the parking lot where people used to line up to ride the duck boats across from Mopop. This is what it looks like now, uncared for, covered from corner to corner with graffiti. Next door sits this abandoned building, boarded up and spray painted all the way around. A piece of plywood over a window is, is basically a blank canvas for them. Look at these buildings along East Marginal Way. New graffiti popping up every day. Both sides of the street hit over and over by taggers. And there's nothing being done to stop it. Exit the northbound State Route 99 tunnel and you'll see this. People have been under lockdown for a year. So got some bored young men, and it normally is young men that do this. I would say the typical offenders, 15 to 25. SPD detective Chris Young used to head up the police department's graffiti task force that was dissolved back in 2017. Guy's an expert. He created the website graphopedia.com, which provides a broad overview of the different types of graffiti seen around the city and the history behind it. He says this is the most tagged up he's seen Seattle in his nearly three decades working the streets. Part of the problem is that a lot of people are working from home and uh, so there's a lot of empty buildings and, you know, people can get away with doing graffiti without being seen. Detective Young says most of it's done between 2 and 4 a.m., sometimes in hard-to-reach spots that may never get painted over. Take this tag, for instance, that reads AIDS in red, black, and white. Thousands drive under it daily as they head out of West Seattle. I think part of the issue is that because of COVID, um, Seattle Public Utilities kind of put a, um, a hold on the graffiti nuisance program, and so it wasn't um, it became much less urgent. Since the program's pause in March of last year, SPU tells me it's received around 15,000 reports of graffiti. The Seattle Municipal Code states property owners are responsible for cleanup, but until the graffiti nuisance program is brought back to life, there's zero enforcement. For now, the best way to get taggers to stop, paint over their work right away. The guys who do it put a lot of work into it, and if you paint it the next day, they'll leave you alone. Graffiti has now become a low priority for SPD and falls under the general investigation unit. The officers the department does have are now busy responding to high priority 911 calls. That has a huge impact um, on our ability to, to catch these people. Um, that of course is the best way to, to get someone who is a tagger or someone who's graffitiing is to, to catch them in the act. Yes, there's a lot to be encouraged by, they say. This all came out during a call with the Department of Health. That's always good to report. However, maybe unsurprisingly, they say we can't get ahead of ourselves. We certainly cannot remove a mass mandate like other states are doing. And while 15 percent of the state has received at least one shot of the vaccine, they say that leaves 85 percent of the state still vulnerable and waiting. 
We're in like mile 21 of a marathon right now. 21 down, five miles to go. But as Assistant Secretary of Health Lacey Fehrenbach stressed, and as runners out there know, the home stretch can be the hardest. And uh, the, the, the finish line is there. And it's not time to slow down or give up. But the road ahead has some hills. Variants are on the rise. Now 55 reported cases of the variants originating in the UK and South Africa are here. And today health officials announced the Johnson & Johnson vaccine here now will not be delivered to Washington for the next three weeks. Everyone's tired. Everyone's tired of hearing this. Everyone wants to get some normalcy back to their lives. School bus driver Yvonne Anderson is one of 260,000 state educators and child care providers now eligible for a vaccine. I drive special needs and some of these kids have very, are very high risk and I cannot, and some of those kids require you to be right up there next to them. Yvonne still needs to book an appointment. What's been hard for educators, the state recognized after their sudden eligibility encouraged by the president. We were not anticipating uh, to make this, um, this pivot uh, this week. Uh, nobody was uh, across the country. Despite the challenges, the state says there's plenty of hopeful signs ahead. Cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are down. Essential workers will soon be eligible, and more doses are on the way. Next week's allocation forecast is still about 100,000 doses shy of what our pr providers are requesting, but we're moving in the right direction. Evicted and being sued for back rent, the Seattle City Council wants to give you a free attorney, regardless of your income. That's the whole point here, is making sure that people um, are getting access to representation. The council's Renter Rights Committee just approved a bill modeled after something similar in San Francisco and New York. But those laws had income thresholds. An advocate that worked in New York says those thresholds proved to be too cumbersome. It was definitely a really hard thing to do in New York City, um, and I, I would definitely discourage it as much as possible in here, but I also think it's an unnecessary barrier. Seattle's idea? A free attorney to anyone who wants it. And the bill's on a fast track because Seattle's eviction moratorium ends March 31st. We definitely don't want the moratoriums to end without renters having counsel, so I think that it's, it's really important that we do this. This is... Uh, simply unfair. Says a representative of commercial landlords who claims 95% of renters in the city are paying on time. But people who have no money truly need help. But the no income limit for a free attorney lets some renters game the system. It's smash and grab politics on the part of the city council. And again, it's incoherent. Um, it just doesn't represent a correlation with any real need uh, in the community. What's needed is eviction prevention. There's an average of 1,200 evictions a year in the city, and the council estimates it will cost $750,000 annually to pay for those attorneys. But housing advocates say there will be a tsunami of evictions once the moratorium ends. So this won't be a usual year. If the city council approves the free attorney bill on Monday and the mayor agrees and signs it, it could go into effect mid-April, just after the moratorium ends. In Seattle, Matt Markovich, Como News. Hi, everyone. I'm Preston Phillips from Como News. Thanks for checking out the Como YouTube channel. You can see more of our videos right here by clicking on the video links for more news from the Seattle area and western Washington. Oh, and don't forget to click the subscribe button below so you don't miss our YouTube updates.